reference of technology issue this morning, so I'm going to use my phone for my notes. <laughs> I'm not going to go as far as Pentecostals and say we got a demon when you get cast out. <laughs> sometimes the devil does try to throw you off. Romans chapter 3, we'll continue from where we were two weeks ago. We thank for Junior for filling in again. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, Lord willing, we'll look at verses 5 through 8 today. But one. The hard part about teaching verse by verse through the text is that you can't just skip over the stuff that you don't like or to, it's hard to understand and explain. Yeah. And here, uh, I hope I can explain this in a way that makes sense, but Paul is raising several objections to, because the Jews did not all believe and because God is still faithful despite our unbelief, as we saw in the previous lesson. Verse 5, we'll pick up here and says, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So, I know that the way that King James translation words that is, might be confusing to the average reader, but Lord Bob will make some sense of it today with the help of God. But he's he continuing on from the thought of how the God is faithful despite our unbelief and despite our wickedness. He says, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Well, it's important to note that at the end of this verse, he says, I speak as a man. These things he is bringing out are from man's perspective. Mm -hmm. The way man thinks about things from the, from the carnal mind, you might say. He says, but if our unrighteousness command the righteousness of God, what shall we say? If God is faithful and just and pure despite our unbelief, despite our unrighteousness, if God is working and accomplishing his purpose, not only in spite of those things, but also by means of them, he said, well, what is the problem then? Mm -hmm. Well, that is the way man thinks. Well, I, if God is using even my sin to get his glory, then why am I held responsible? This is the objection that is raised here in verse 7. We'll see. <clears throat> oh. Yes, God is in control of all things. We see that in Ephesians 1 11. He worked all the counsel of his own will. Romans 8 28 tells us that he's working all things together for our good. Those who love God, those who really call according to His purpose. Amen. Yes, God is working not only in spite of our wickedness, but even sometimes by means of it. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's hard for us to comprehend how that God works that way, but that He brings all things to pass for His glory. And He certainly will get all the glory out of everything. Amen. With another way one might say this is if our unrighteousness displays the righteousness of God even greater. If even in the midst of our sinfulness God is glorified and his character is magnified, then, then why is there an issue there? Mm -hmm. You see, well, going back to the garden, God would have been glorified if Adam and Eve had continued sinlessly for all of eternity and worship. Right. But if we see him even more with them displaying his mercy and his grace and his love by covering their sins, by sending Christ to die for us. Amen. God commanded his love toward us and the while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 tells us. If God would have been glorified, he still would have been very just as much merciful and gracious and a loving God, 
Sin had never entered the picture, but yet through sin he displays these other things too. Right. And that. Which, because sin entered the world, that we see his mercy and his grace. It's in sending Christ to die for us, we, for our sins, that we see really the greatest example of his love that he could show to us. <clears throat> and not just wiping out and destroying the world, but you know, we see his long suffering. Uh, so it may seem that wickedness abound and that even that Satan has the upper hand, but yet we can be sure God is working his purpose and will get the glory out of all things. Amen. But that doesn't excuse man of his sin. <clears throat> we can't use that as an excuse. So Romans 9, verse 17, one of so Larry's favorite passage of Scripture tells us that God even raised up Pharaoh for his glory and honor. Mm -hmm. Amen. For the same purpose that I raised up Pharaoh, that I might show my power on him, and my name might be known throughout the whole earth. And Revelation 4 and 11 tells us that he is worthy of glory and honor and praise for he created all things for his pleasure, they are and were created. Amen. We'll turn over to First Chronicles and read one passage from David for us. First Chronicles chapter 29. We'll read verses 10 through 13. It says, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Notice especially verse 11. It says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, thou art exalted as head above all. Amen. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thy hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. You add. See, David recognized that all glory belongs to God, and that he will really get the glory out of all things, both in earth and in heaven. So we can so once again, we can be sure that God will get the glory even out of Satan when he cast him in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is not taken off guard by our sin or by the wickedness that's going on in this world. But then the objection is raised in the next part of the verse, it is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Well, because God is working his will and way, yet he is going to judge sin one day. He says, well, is God unrighteous? No, he must be wrong because he takes vengeance or because he will one day punish sin because he uses sin for his glory. That's their objection. But we can be sure God is going to take vengeance one day. Second Thessalonians tells us that. Let's turn there for just a moment. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Now this word vengeance in particular here in our text it means wrath. It means God's punishment against sin. And it's often translated wrath in the scripture. But here we see Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9. Here is when God will take full vengeance upon sin. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. And the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the power, or excuse me, and from the glory of his power. And one day Christ is going to return as that ruling and reigning king and it says here taking vengeance in a flaming fire on all those who 
don't believe the gospel, mm-hmm. you can be sure God is going to judge sin one day. He's going to, or as our text says, take vengeance upon sin one day. Right. But yet, God is not wrong or unrighteous because he judges sin. God does not have any unrighteousness, unrighteousness in him. Amen. Right. We can see this in several places. First John chapter 1, verse 5 tells us that God is light in him, and in, in him there is no darkness at all. Amen. Light referring to good, darkness to evil, and he has no wickedness about him. Let's go over to chapter 3 of 1 John. So we'll see something I hadn't noticed before. 1 John chapter 3. In verse number 5. You know, right after the verse that says, that sin is a transgression of the law, it says, and ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins in him, and in him there is no sin. Amen. I know we, we immediately think of Christ, and certainly that is the case, but if you read the whole context here, John does not distinguish between God and Christ. Right. That they are one and the same. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you go back in verse 1, he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore the world... Knows us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. And every man that hath his hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. He never even mentions Christ in particular there. So God. Christ are one and the same, and both are without sin. First Peter two twenty one tells us that He is our example that we should walk in His steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in His mouth. I guess God is purely righteous and without sin, and yet He will take vengeance upon sin one day and upon the wicked. Amen. Which leads us back to our next point, back in our text in verse number 6. Paul says, God forbid. This very strong negative that we see once again, as we saw before, that absolutely not, that God is not unrighteous, because he will take vengeance upon sin. But no, God cannot judge the world if he was not righteous. As Paul says next, for then how shall God judge the world? If God is unrighteous, then he would not be a rightful judge. Right? But no, God is not unrighteous, rather he is fully and perfectly righteous. <laughs> so we looked pretty extensively, I think last, in the previous chapter about the judgment of God upon man. But if God was guilty of sin, then he would not be the right judge against sin. Right. It'd be kind of like if uh, Andy Brigham over here was guilty of murder, presiding over a murder trial, that wouldn't be justice. Right. Justice demands that the judge be free of the charges that are against the one he is judging. That God is perfectly pure and sinless and righteous is really the only way that he can be judge of the world. Mm-hmm. As, Paul, as Paul's answer to those of all, is God unrighteous because he takes vengeance against sin? No, he is perfectly righteous and he will perfectly judge the world one day and judge man according to his sin. Amen. Really, for God to be God, he must be pure in all aspects. And we have the world's gods and man's made up gods and they all have some aspect of man about them, don't they? Mm-hmm. We have the Roman gods, they all are really sinful in some sort of way or another. They are not unright, <laughs> they are not righteous, rather they have 
man's sinful nature about them. You see the, uh, the God Allah, or the Muslims, mm -hmm. you know, he has allowed the lie to deceive you. You see all these gods that man has made up, and they all have some sort of man-like characteristic about them. Right. Yet, the true God, Jehovah, the God of the Bible, he is pure in all aspects. He is completely without sin, without the nature of sin, without the curse of sin, without the bad of sin. And that's the only way that he will be able to rightly judge sinners in the day of the judgment. Let's go on to verse number seven here. You see another objection raised, similar to the previous one. He says, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Again, this is man thinking carnally here that he says, if the truth of God abounds through my lie, or if my unbelief and my falsehoods and my unbelief, if my sin contrasts with the truth of God, and that shines more brightly. It's kind of like when you have two contrasting colors, you see the one more clearly. Mm -hmm. If you put blue and green next to each other, they don't stand out so much. But if you put blue and orange next to each other, they stand out pretty well, don't they? Right. Because of our sin, because of our unbelief, because of our, as he calls it here, lie, we see the truth of God magnified even greater. But the man's thinking as well, if God is getting more glory because of my sin, then why am I judged as a sinner, he says. And why should I be judged for my sin if God is getting the glory even out of that? But we see over and over again, God uses sinful men and sinful beings to accomplish his purpose. Right. God used Satan to accomplish a purpose in Job's life. Satan will certainly not be unaccountable before God on the day of judgment. Amen. God used the wicked men of Jerusalem to crucify Christ, which we know was the, the foreordained plan of God, but yet those men will be held accountable when they stand before God. You're right. We can see through scriptures and history itself that God has used wicked men to accomplish his purpose, but that doesn't mean they will be unaccountable before God. Mm -hmm. Just because God ultimately gets the glory doesn't mean sin is excused. Do I think some... This uh, scripture led me to think about how the God works all things together for our good. If you just look in your own life, how He brought things together for your good. Mm -hmm. It's almost an overwhelming thought to how the God could work all those things and how He knew all those things that would come to pass and would need to come to pass. I'll give you one example in my life. You all, except maybe the Andersons know that the Lord saying we didn't revival meeting at Sunnyview when Brother Downs was preaching. But even going back one, going back further than that, my grandparents are the ones who would take me there sometimes. And Amen. Yet before a certain time, they would went to the Presbyterian Church over there. You know how they ended up going to Sunnyview? My grandpa worked as an electrician for the school system. Brother Rich, pastor there, he worked as a bus dispatcher for the school system, and they got to talking one day. And the Lord ended up leading them to leave the Presbyterian Church and go over and join at some of you. Amen. It's just one little example of how God works That's all it. things together for our good. Yeah. You know, He would ultimately in my life, you know, I wouldn't go to church every Sunday or anything like that, but He would burden me to go to that revival meeting. And he's no doubt laid upon Brother Downs' heart the message I needed to hear that day. Amen. So God gets the glory out of all things, even the littlest of things. Amen. You know, he said, this, these people here, this 
people are being, being carnally minded, they would say, well, God is getting the glory, then why am I being judged for my sin? Mm -hmm. if, if it's all working out for good, then, then does it really matter the purpose or the way it gets there? That's the way man thinks, doesn't he? Right. You know, Paul kind of continues on the same thought in verse number eight. He goes on saying, not rather, this is his somewhat sarcastic answering of them. You know, well, why don't you just, uh, don't just stop at accusing God of unrighteousness. Why don't you just keep going? He says, you know, don't stop with this foolishness that you shouldn't be judged as a sinner, but rather keep going down that same line of thinking. And then he enters this little parenthetical statement, as we be slanderous to report, and as some affirm that we say, it was that there were some that were speaking evil against Paul and others there, and saying that they, they taught this type of thing, that you know, just because good happens at the end, then it doesn't matter how you get there. That's, it. That's what man thinks, though, isn't it? You're right. That's the way the carnal mind thinks. Amen. If the ends justify as means, is what we would say today. Right. That's never the case with God. Amen. But here is what he says, well, if you're following that same line of thinking, this is where you'll end up. Let us do evil that good may come. Well, that sounds foolish, doesn't it? It's the same type of thinking that we'll see again in a couple more chapters when God or Paul is teaching that you were sinned in bound, grace did much more bound, and some mm -hmm. say, well, then if I sin more, I'll get more grace. But no, that's not how it works either. All right. right. So the carnal mind thinks, just here, well, let us do evil that good may come. Well, if God is being glorified, if good is coming, you know, in spite of and by means of my evil, and I'll just keep doing evil, and more good will come. That's not how it works. You're right. You know what man thinks that well everything's going all right and, and everything I seem getting my way and so I must be doing something right. <laughs> but yet the spiritual mind says, Well, I'm just gonna do what glorifies God and what whatever comes may come. Mm. You know, the spiritual mind says, Well, I've been I received all this of God and all glory belongs to him. Amen. So the carnal mind thinks, well, I must do this for this to happen. I must do good things and good things will happen. Or here, if God is glorified in evil, then I'm going to do evil and God will be glorified in that. You know, we are simply to serve God and he will get the glory out of all things. Amen. You know, Paul doesn't even spend much time addressing this type of thinking because it's really foolishness. He says, whose damnation is just. That these type of people, their damnation is just. That their condemnation will, will be just and fitting. That they will not be without excuse when they stand before God. That the judgment that is against them will be right in accordance with God's righteousness. Amen. Yet we see the same type of teaching today, even among some professing Christians. Though, just, just do what feels good, mm -hmm. as long as you mean well. But no, we are simply strive to serve God, try to bring glory and honor to Him. But we know that He will get the glory and honor ultimately of all things. Amen. That He will work all things together for good and then I love him and then we're called according to his purpose and we even when Satan and sinners are cast into the lake of fire God will be glorified in that you're right amen that's sometimes that's beyond the comprehension of the carnal mind but the Holy Spirit gives understanding we'll go ahead and close there I think next week we'll Paul begins to lay the groundwork for looking into the depravity of man. Mm -hmm. you know, our, 
here kind of be, will be the summary of the next several verses. He said, are we any better than others? No, we're all wicked and sinful. That's it. I'm going to close with that.